Hello, this is Dr. Sullivan, and in this video we'll be covering excitation contraction coupling, which is how skeletal muscles contract. In this image that you see here, you can see the axon terminal of a motor neuron. This is the neuron that is going to be stimulating the muscle. This entire complex that we're looking at in this picture is called the neuromuscular junction, the meeting of a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle. The synaptic terminal, or the axon terminal, comes down towards the muscle cell and widens out into an area called the synaptic end bulb. The synaptic end bulb has vesicles inside of it that are filled with a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. This neurotransmitter is the chemical that will stimulate the receptors on the muscle side to allow the muscle to conduct its own action potential for contraction. As the nerve impulse travels down the synaptic terminal and into the synaptic end bulb, the change in membrane potential is going to stimulate the opening of voltage-gated calcium ion channels. That's going to cause an influx of calcium ions into the synaptic end bulb. The calcium ions in the synaptic end bulb are going to stimulate the exocytosis of these synaptic vesicles. That exocytosis means it will release its neurotransmitter outside of the cell. The space between the synaptic end bulb and the muscle cell is called the synaptic cleft. The synapse is the communication between a neuron and its effector cell or a neuron and another neuron. Because this is called a synapse, we have a membrane that is before the synapse and a membrane that is after the synapse. We refer to these as the presynaptic and the postsynaptic membrane based on their location relative to the synaptic cleft. So in this case, the neuron is the presynaptic membrane and the muscle cell is the postsynaptic membrane. In a neuromuscular junction, the postsynaptic membrane is called the motor end plate. In the motor end plate, there will be sodium ion channels that are ligand gated, which means they are stimulated to open by a chemical. That particular chemical that opens these ligand gated sodium ion channels is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's inside these synaptic vesicles and is being released when the nerve impulse reaches the synaptic end bulb and opens up the calcium ion channels. When that neurotransmitter acetylcholine stimulates the receptor on the sodium ion channels, it results in an influx of sodium. Sodium ions coming in, raising the membrane potential of the motor end plate, bringing it closer to zero, making it less negative, depolarizing it, all those terms are synonymous, and bringing it closer to threshold which would be the specific voltage of membrane potential that stimulates the opening of voltage-gated sodium and potassium ion channels, which would result in a muscle action potential, much like it would result in a neuron action potential if we were talking about a neuron. So let's see the membranes close up and see what's happening. So again, the arrival of the nerve signal or nerve impulse from a motor nerve or motor neuron results in an influx of calcium ions into the synaptic end bulb. The calcium ions res result in the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter from the synaptic vesicles into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter in those synaptic vesicles, stimulates a receptor on an ion channel. That receptor causes the opening of ion channels and an influx of sodium, outflux of potassium ions. By opening up those ion channels and allowing an influx of sodium due to concentration gradients and an outflux of potassium, we're going to generate a graded potential. We'll call that the end plate potential. If this end plate potential is large enough, it's going to stimulate the opening of voltage-gated ion channels in the sarcolemma, 
of the muscle cell. Remember, the sarcolemma is the membrane of a muscle cell. If that happens, then we have what's called a muscle action potential. That muscle action potential will travel along the sarcolemma like tipping dominoes throughout the entire muscle cell. And that is what you see depicted in number five here. We open up the ligand gated ion channels and if they stimulate a large enough end plate potential then that's going to stimulate the opening of voltage gated ion channels which you see here and that's going to result in what's called a muscle action potential. So once that muscle action potential is generated it's going to travel along the sarcolemma. In this picture you can see here's the sarcolemma and these are the T tubules which create little valleys in the sarcolemma along the muscle cell. Adjacent to those valleys inside the muscle cell is the terminal cistern of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember from the anatomy part of this unit the sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscles stores calcium ions. In the sarcoplasmic reticulum's terminal cistern there are voltage-gated calcium ion channels. These voltage-gated calcium ion channels remain closed when the muscle is at rest. If a muscle action potential is generated along the sarcolemma, it travels along the sarcolemma and into the T-tubules and is close enough in proximity to the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cistern to open up those voltage-gated calcium ion channels. Remember, this muscle action potential is a change in voltage in the membrane potential. If this muscle action potential travels down the T-tubules, it will stimulate the opening of voltage-gated ion channels, calcium ion channels, in the terminal cistern. When that happens, calcium ions, as you can see here, are released into the sarcoplasm of the muscle cell. Let's hold that thought for a second. Remember the anatomy of the myofilaments, the actin and the myosin, the thick and thin myofilaments. The myosin were these thick filaments with the heads and tails. The thin filaments were a combination of actin, which are the circular yellow proteins here, and troponin and tropomyosin complex, which hold the actin together, kind of like a string of pearls, but also cover binding sites for myosin. Each actin protein has a binding site for myosin heads, meaning that when the opportunity avails itself, the myosin head will chemically react with the actin binding site and create a bond between the two. Much like the myosin head is reaching out and grabbing onto the actin. Now at rest, the troponin tropomyosin complex covers up those myosin binding sites. So the myosin can't reach out and grab the actin. However, when calcium is released from the terminal cistern into the cytoplasm, it chemically reacts and bonds to the troponin of the troponin and tropomyosin complex. That chemical reaction creates a shift in the position of the troponin and tropomyosin complex, revealing the myosin binding sites on the actin. So if calcium is released from the terminal cistern, it will open up the myosin binding sites on the actin proteins so that the myosin heads can reach out and grab the actin. This is why calcium is so important for muscle contraction. It's not just for bones and teeth. It's very important for nerve impulse transmission at the chemical synapse and for muscle contraction.